Well, from the beginning of my life, it's not been easy because my dad died at a, when I was about five. So I uh, was adopted by my auntie. I grew up with my aunt. I didn't see my mom for about uh, seven years. It was so hard because my aunt had about five kids. I was the only one who was not her own. And I was treated a little differently from the family. My aunt, she used to say, you will be useless. You will never get a job. You will never get any qualification. But all that, I was uh, determined to do the opposite. And that's what I did. And then growing up, because I was different again at school, because uh, I grew up like uh, playing with girls, dolls, uh, playing netball with girls. Uh, at that time, I didn't know my sexuality, but I had so many girlfriends, friends. I was not interested in girls. Uh, but it was strange because it's not something I knew or something in Uganda they talk about. So I was thinking, I'm a weird person. Uh, why do I have feelings for the boys? Because I know it's a taboo in Uganda. And it's not something you would think there is another person. So I, I grew up in a, a lonely environment whereby I didn't have a dad, I didn't have a mom, I didn't know who I am. And I think at that age, that's when my life started turning down. When I feel really down, I like to visit the rose gardens in Portsmouth or walk around the seafront and just to have that sea breathe. It helps me to calm down or to feel much better. The reason I left Uganda is because um, we were caught uh, in a gay-friendly pub in Uganda. And then in June 2000, I went to the pub and then the gay men were arrested. I was luckily not to be arrested on that day. And then those guys were taken to the prison, they were beaten to the police, they were beaten up really badly. They told them to mention the names of all gay men who were there, all gay people they know. Then they started looking for us and on the radio they started mentioning the names of those gay men. So my parents, they came to know, uh, my mom came to know, my aunties, and they started looking for me. So when I knew, I didn't go back. And uh, at a time when this happened, I was working in a, a bank. I was a, a, a branch manager. So I was well known in almost every bank in Kampala. So my life was in danger because my face was known and that really scared me. So I had to pay for the agent to help me to get the visa, the passport, to be able to leave the country. And uh, I loved in this country in September 2001. So I was arrested on that day. They told me, you don't have any strings attached. So you, we have to detain you. It was a scary moment. And uh, I think that's the, the time it was bringing back the, the memories of w what happened to me when I was in, in Uganda. Because uh, at that time, I was thinking, I've run away from the prison, but I'm now getting into another prison where I've taken myself into it. At that particular time, I didn't know, even if I say, that uh, I'm a gay person or I left Uganda because of my sexuality, I'll be arrested or beaten up because I didn't know there is any other pass, uh, any other country which can accept gay people. So then I was thinking now, I'm now at the age, there's nothing to do. I can't go back, I can't go forward. So at that time I would say, if they are going to kill me, I'd rather say I'm gay and then they go on with it because I was thinking 
they will not, nobody will ever accept me who I am. So the Home Office after month wrote a letter back to me saying, yeah, you are allowed to stay, but we are giving you one year. And then after, you will be able to apply for extension. So I started looking for work. I started working as a carer. Uh, we used to go in nursing homes. Uh, I did everything just to earn my living. It was so hard. It was so hard to the point whereby I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where I can get help. Apart from uh, thinking about the small group of people who are helping me, especially from the church, uh, then you smile when you are with the people, and then when you go back to your room, then you cry because you don't know what else you can do. And I think that's the time I would be thinking I would work day and night to take off things off my head. I used it to work one shift and then I run to another one and just to cope, just to, to be able to control what is in my head. Because the more I was staying in my room, the more I started feeling worse and getting paranoid and, you know, thinking nobody cares. They started having those suicidal thoughts because you think nobody wants you. With the men, especially in a black community, it is so hard because um, men think uh, if you talk about your mental health, you are weak. Uh, they have that mentality, thinking that the mental health is uh, not something which exists at all. Because unless it has happened to you, and again, mental health has so many levels. And especially with the men, they don't talk about it. The reason why? Because it shows their weakness. Uh, sometimes they think you are just a, a wimp. Uh, so they don't want to discuss about it. So they shy away. Because in the most cases, we talk about too late when some people, they have lost their life and then they will just say, oh, I wish I talked to you, you talked to me. Or, but because of the negative stuff about mental health in the men, it's so hard for other men to come up to talk about it. Mm. I think being accepted, I think it's one of the things which has helped me a lot to, um, to improve the way I was, especially my uh, mental health. Because talking to people and then the people, they understand what you are going through and they accept you as who you are. And to be empowered that uh, at least now uh, I can do things myself by not relying on other people. It's good to empower somebody because now me being able to go to work and I can go to the shop and pay for my food other than taking vouchers and everything because that's one of the things you feel like you are still uh, inferior, that you can't be able to look after yourself. The one thing I would say to my young self is uh, that is a journey. And that journey is long, where you have to go through hills and valleys. When you're in hell, you have to continue saying, I'm on hell, but things will get better. When you get in a valley, don't relax. Don't think everything is okay. There is another hill above you but you have to make sure that you have to find a way how to get through all these uh, puddles and if you have a chance to see somebody who is willing to help talk to them listen to what they offer and that will help you to uh, to achieve your journey because the journey you are on is long but will not end if you don't have support from other people I've seen it all